The Fall of X continues. Welcome to the Comic Story and Complete Story series, where we take trade paperbacks and single issues and we break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then we read them dramatically back to you. All alterations to the panel's text and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. We are nearing the end of the Fall of X event. Orcus has the world blaming mutants for the deaths of thousands of humans after the Hellfire Gala Massacre. The mutants now prepare to face off against the forces that are actually causing all of this. This is X-Men 30, 31, and 32. It was originally released as a members-only video, but today, everyone gets to watch it. I hope you enjoy. The X-Men are now an underground resistance force fighting against Orcus and their rule of the Earth and systematic elimination of all mutants. They meet in the underground Morlock tunnels. They've teamed up with the likes of Spider-Man, the Gold Goblin, and Tony Stark to fight back against Orcus, who have laced the Krakoan medicine with nanite kill switches that they activate and blame on the mutants. I'm uncomfortable with skipping human trials before we put the science into the population. Norman points out, shocking everyone. Well, this is a first for Norman Osborn. Spider-Man comments, and Sink nods his head, but points out that they need to counteract Orcus's drugs before the team can even move forward with stopping them. How about we administer this patch without raising alarms at Orcus? Talon asks, and Spider-Man sighs, pointing out that it would be easier if they could get their enemies to do it for them. Sink smiles at the wall crawler as his joke gives him an idea. The answer to our problem is on Counter-Earth. He says as he turns to Talon, explaining that when the High Evolutionary came to Earth, he offered the X-Men a device that would wipe out all human DNA. If they can override it and adapt it, they can use it to alter the nanites in the human bloodstream and patch out the kill switch. Spider-Man, Gold Goblin, and Tony Stark all head out, wishing the X-Men the best of luck and asking them to call when the time is right. So what's the quickest way to counter Earth? Talon asks, and Kamala looks at her with fear. I just remembered I have a ton of homework? She says quietly and Sink smiles, telling her that they can handle the mission without her. Meanwhile, Tony Stark is meeting with Firestar over in Atlanta Ocean. As they fly, he explains that she needs to complete her mission as a double agent and get out of Orcus before the final assault. They have the whole world in a vice. Is this going to work? Firestar asks, reminding him of all the people on the Krakoa medicine that could die. And Tony Stark shakes his head. We have a solution. It's now on Sink and Talon. They're off to counter Earth. Tony explains. Meanwhile, across the galaxy, Talon and Sink land on Counter-Earth. They are immediately beset upon by the High Evolutionary's animal men, but luckily for the mutants, the hybrids aren't big fans of their master. A few of them lead the pair to the High Evolutionary's fortress where they quickly find his ship and they get a hold of the Bio-Bomb. As they step off of the ship, they find the High Evolutionary and his daughter waiting for them. Sink and Talon, do you think that you could escape my notice? I see you're holding my biohacking device. Have you reconsidered my gift to mutantdom? I hear rumors that you've waited too long and you've lost your dominance of Earth. The villain says and Sink glares at him. That was never what we wanted. It was freely offered once and we have a great need for it now. He snaps and Talon steps forward, preparing to fight. Do you want to fight us? She growls and the High Evolutionary cocks an eyebrow at her. I haven't decided yet. He simply says, and Luminous steps forward, begging her father to allow her to destroy the mutants. But Sink taps into the remnants of Jean Grey's power, now that she has perished, and brings Luminous to her knees in moments as the images of her father experimenting on her fill her mind. I need help! Luminous gasps as she reaches out for her father and he glances down at her. How disappointing! He mutters and finally looks back at the mutants. You may keep your prize if you survive me. Sink draws on Laura, aka Talon's powers, and the two pop claws and leap at the villain, slashing him across the face. Meanwhile, back at the Orcus space station, Firestar warns the head of Orcus that the X-Men are planning to assault from space and will be landing their ships in Australia to minimize human casualties, as she's secretly a double agent working for Orcus, but actually working for the X-Men. Devo smiles and thanks her for the information, promising that this will be the death of the X-Men. Every single sentinel will be waiting for them, he promises. Back in the Morlock tunnels, Sink hands off the biobomb to Tony Stark. That's amazing, congrats. I'll start to load our fix, he says, and Sink nods his head, turning to leave the room. Everything okay? We'll live, Sink says softly, rounding the corner to find Laura waiting for him. Everett, 
Why can't I remember how we escaped Counter-Earth? She asks, and he shrugs his shoulders. You were badly hurt on the way to the shuttle. Once again, almost killed and captured covering our escape. Zink explains, and he turns to Kamala as she comes up behind him. Hey, Everett, who were you talking to? And that's when she finds Sink standing by himself. Sink heads to his room, where he finds the older Laura waiting on his bed. She stares at him, realizing the truth. X-23, Talon, Laura Kinney. The older version that was locked within the vault was killed by the High Evolutionary on Counter-Earth. But Sink used his remnants of Jean's powers to keep Laura's consciousness locked in his mind. You're still alive, Talon. I pulled your mind inside of me. I'm like Cerebro. I'll hold you as long as I can. We'll fix this, I promise. Sink whispers to her. In Everett's mind, he and Laura are sitting on a park bench. She tries to tell him that he can't keep this up. That using the remnants of Jean's power to hold her mind inside of him is killing him. That he needs to help their friends in the coming battle. In reality, Sink is lying in his bed, sweat dripping off of his body as he curls into the fetal position. It ain't over, not yet. He gasps to Laura in his mind, Kitty and Kurt standing over him, doing what they can for their friend. Meanwhile, Kamala and Spider-Man are on the rooftop of the Oscorp building, monitoring the biobomb as it begins to rewrite the nanites that have poisoned the humans on Crack Cohen medicine so that Orcus could kill them with a flip of a switch. Kamala turns to Peter. I know the High Evolutionary designed this fear to turn us all sterile or make us lizards, but imagine the good we're doing with it, she says with joy, and Peter nods. You don't have to tell me twice. This is fun and easy. But they look down to see Nimrod's image on the computer screen. I jinxed it! Peter groans. I bet you thought Orcus wouldn't notice you until it's too late. But you'd have been wrong. Nimrod says. Meanwhile, back in Sink's mind, he's still trying to hold on to Laura. But the park has begun to burn up around them. You're gonna have to do the hard thing, darling. Laura says. But Sink refuses. She explains that the only reason using remnants of people's powers wasn't killing him before was because he was using her healing factor to heal himself. You were already stressing your body, and now I'm collapsing your mind. You can't take it anymore, she whispers to him. Out of his mind, Kitty is leaning over his bed, trying to shout at her friend that they need him in their fight with Nimrod. If you can hear me, don't let Talon's sacrifice be in vain. I know you're holding her in here but they're going to make a lot more dead X-Men unless we both get in the fight, Kitty says before she phases through the wall. But Sink reaches up, holding his head, sweat pouring off of him. No, he's not gone. You're wrong. I can hold it. He gasps. Meanwhile, back on the roof, Nimrod has arrived. He knocks both Kamala and Spider-Man away and prepares to destroy the biobomb computers. But suddenly, Kurt is on top of him and bamps them both into the streets below. You're an artificial intelligence, ja? Can we avoid the fight and have an intelligent conversation instead? They'll never get rid of us, Kurt says, but Nimrod rushes at him. While well, you slept in your paradise, we scripted your end, mutant. Nimrod snaps as he lashes out, but Kurt teleports away, and Nimrod only hits a car, knocking it into the streets. But Kitty phases up from the street, stabbing Nimrod in the legs. Got any Achilles heel in there, ugly? He asks as she dashes away. Get ready to get trucked! Kitty shouts as she moves, and Spider-Man aims the truck for Nimrod. Nimrod doesn't move, merely reaching out and grabbing Spider-Man by the throat. Mutant, surrender and receive my mercy, Nimrod calls, but Kurt teleports back in, grabbing Spidey and bamfing out. This is getting annoying, Nimrod growls, Kitty phasing back through Nimrod, but the bot gloats that his new body is safe from Kitty's phasing disrupting it. I just wanted your dead eyes on me. She says with a shrug as Wolverine leaps off the rooftops above, slamming into Nimrod, driving his claws into the bot's head. Everyone else fall back! This beast's mine! Wolverine bellows with rage, but Nimrod grabs him, tossing him into the ground! Back in Sink's mind, Laura is telling him that he must let go, that he needs to go and help his friends. Scott and Jean trusted us to lead the X-Men. If we succeed, then Orcus has no more hostages. That's the job, to save as many people as we can every day. She says as she hugs him. I love you, Laura. He whispers to her and she nods, smiling, stepping back. And I loved you. Now go, that's in order. She tells him and they embrace one final time. And then the older Laura, Talon, is gone. Everett opens his eyes with a gasp. Back on the streets above, the X-Men are doing their best to fight off Nimrod, but the robot is defeating them. 
you could have left and traveled the stars. We might have followed, but maybe you'd have gotten away. I will never truly understand you mutants, Nimrod says as he tosses Kitty into the ground. But that's when Sink floats up behind him. We didn't leave because we belong, Sink says, his eyes beginning to glow as lightning begins to form in the skies above. He calls down lightning, striking it against Nimrod, forcing the robot to its knees where it's forced to reboot. But Nimrod is quickly up. Pretty good shot. Is that the best you could do? Nimrod asks, and Sink smiles, shaking his head. No, we have a war to win. So we get a short stay of execution. The day is won. Sink says as Spider-Man confirms that the biobomb did its work. Spider-Man snaps out a web, grabbing Wolverine before Sink can teleport them all away, leaving Nimrod bellowing in rage in the streets of New York. The team then appears in the forest of the Rocky Mountains. Thank you for saving us, Kurt says, putting a hand on Sink's shoulder, knowing what it costs their leader. Talon is gone. I had to let her go. Sink explains, turning to Kitty. Shadowcat, get word to Polaris that the hostages are free. She's got the green light, Sink says with determination. Over at Meinkin's Island, the site of the so-called Mutant Massacre, the lighthouse keeper waits in his house, watching TV while drinking a beer, when suddenly the door kicks open and an Orcus assassin enters with a gun. Orcus is finally moving into the final phase of our plan, and we realize that we missed the loose end in the lighthouse, the assassin says with a smile as he raises his pistol. I'm impressed a lesser man who was the sole survivor of the Mutant Massacre would have gone into hiding, but the man smiles, raising his beer. I should warn you, I ain't the only one who survived, you bastards. He says, and from behind his chair, a small purple dragon peeks out, Lockheed leaping across the room, burning the assassin, leaving him a charred corpse on the ground. Nice to see you feeling better. Now you're gonna be off to war? The man asks Lockheed with a smile. Around the world, Emma Frost has begun to link the remaining members of the X-Men, preparing them for the final assault, and she announces to the team that Polaris has returned and destroyed the Orcus orbital platform. Tony Stark's Sentinel Buster armor has arrived, and it is drawing the Sentinels to Australia. Keep resisting, Emma tells her team telepathically. Meanwhile, at the Stryker Education Center for Disadvantaged Youth, another powerful mutant has returned. Welcome home, Magic. I'll make sure you have a proper welcome, Emma says as Magic swoops down, smashing through the window, taking out two guards with her sword. Thanks, Emma, Magic thinks, and Emma notes that Magic seems to be moving slower and breathing heavily. These Orcus goons infected me with something, blocked my teleportation. I'm gonna get right or die trying, Magic says as she storms through the base, quickly taking down several guards. She is still struggling though, grabbing one of the Orcus guns. Never cared for guns, but I'm good with them. She snaps as she raises the weapon, blasting several more as they rush through the corridor. For the moment of peace, Magic sags against the wall. Taking out the trash sure is hard work, she gasps, and Emma is still in her mind. Magic, perhaps wait for my backup to arrive, Emma suggests, but Magic shakes her head. I'm good, Emma. I'm gonna press onward. I'm a war captain on Krakoa, she grunts, heading into the next lab where she finds a scientist burning paperwork. The scientist turns in shock at her entrance. Hi, Miss Mutant, the scientist says, his eyes straying towards the nearby pistol on the desk, and Magic raises her weapon. Don't even think about it, she gasps, ordering him to deactivate the nanites in her blood that are killing her. I want them out, she orders, but she sags, her body being weakened by the moment. The man smiles, reaching for the pistol, aiming it at her. I'll make it quick, he promises, but Kitty phases through the floor, smacking the weapon away. Kitty, is that really you? Magic asks as she staggers, but Kitty catches her as she kicks the scientist and knocks him out. Thought you were dead, they both whisper to each other as Kitty holds up her friend. She pulls Magic to her feet, explaining that she was sent to free everyone from prison. Are you ready to empty this gulag with me? Kitty asks, and Magic takes a deep breath, raising her sword. If I'm going out, I'm going out swinging my sword. Magic promises, and they fight their way through the prison until they finally reach the control room, and Magic slams the button that opens up the cells. With their work done, Magic slumps into a nearby chair, her eyes beginning to droop shut. I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm glad Emma sent you. Magic whispers, but Kitty takes her hand, shaking her head, explaining that she was already in the prison on a mission when Magic arrived. Well, if Emma didn't send you, then who is she sending? Magic gasps when suddenly the roof begins to quake above their heads, and it is ripped apart as they both look up as Polaris 
floats down towards them. Sup, ladies? I can taste the iron in the air. Good work. Polara stands over magic and is able to sense the nanites in her blood. I think I can remove them, but it's gonna hurt like hell. Polara sells her friend, and magic just glares at her. I want them out! She growls, and Polaris nods, beginning. She pulls the nanites out of Magic's bloodstream. Magic screams in pain, but in moments, it's done. She slumps to the ground as a sentinel finally arrives to stop the prison break. The sentinel reaches for them, but Polaris throws up a shield, warning her friends that she can't just smash them anymore. They have countermeasures. Keep it looking at you. Kitty says as she phases through the floor. Magic gets back on her feet, quickly recovering, opening up a portal and teleporting away. All right, let's kill this ugly thing, she says, and both she and Polaris teleport to the Sentinel's head. Magic cuts a hole through the top of it, and Polaris pulls down a power line, shoving it inside. To me, my power lines! Polaris shouts before the whole Sentinel short circuits, dropping to the ground. In the front of the prison, the rest of the mutant detainees are quickly escaping, and Emma pulls up in her white limo. Well done, all. Now get in. We're killing the fascists, Emma says to the three women. Suddenly, there's a blur of purple from inside of the limo. Oh, and Catherine, I have a surprise for you. Emma says with a smile as Lockheed rushes past her and wraps itself around Kitty and Magic. Emma looks at Polaris and Kitty, explaining that Nimrod is next on their hit list, but Scott's voice suddenly fills their minds. Cyclops, it's so nice of you to join us. Scott thanks her and says that he has an asset from Orcus. Dr. Ayla Grieger. I don't think our problems are just over yet, Magic. If you're up for joining me, Scott tells her. She smiles, opening a portal. Her sword is ready on her shoulder. Of course, I'm a war captain. I was born ready, she says as she disappears. And there you have it. X-Men 30, 31, and 32. We have just one more video to go as we reach the conclusion of the Fall of X event. So be sure to have your notifications turned on to get alerted when that does get released. And of course, be sure to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time. Rest in peace, Benny.